Okay. Um, my name is David Price. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be taking you through, I think it's supposed to be about 20 minutes of slides. Um, I know that particular questions could pop up at the bottom, but if there's any problems, or if Kenji, if you can't hear me, then you can always just jump in at any point. So, the topic we were given to cover was to look at really the, the common ground between cardiovascular disease and diabetes and how we assess the risk and whether there's any kind of common ground between them that we should be perhaps looking for these conditions together. So, the way I was going to look through the content was to cover these points and as you'll see as we go through them I will highlight in red the next content which is relevant. So, risk scoring for cardiovascular disease, how do we do it? Risk scoring for type 2 diabetes, do we do it? And if so, how do we do it? Uh, thirdly, should we be trying to risk score for these conditions at the same time? And if so, how would we do it? And then to finish off, just a really single slide looking at you know potential treatment and just looking at risk-benefit options because sometimes when you treat one of the conditions, you kind of get a downside with one of the others. So we'll go through those, those four points uh, one by one. So firstly, just a general condition, a general point of argument. Why would we want to screen or risk score for any condition? And really it comes down to trying to obtain benefit, but at a certain cost. So the benefit we're looking for here is that we hopefully can intervene at an early stage to reduce mortality or morbidity from cardiovascular disease and or diabetes. And so this is kind of an appropriate strategy for a serious disease. But as I said, you need to weigh up risks and benefits. So in this case, there's always a balance between the workload which you're going to undertake to find the condition and the cost of money that you need to spend to find the condition. And then there's the benefit of potentially preventing subsequent problems, such as uh, you could potentially prevent diabetes, you could prevent complications from diabetes, you could prevent myocardial infarctions, etc. Now, all of this is quite logical. Obviously, if you target high-risk individuals with an intervention, or if you screen them, they are the ones with the most to gain. If you can find those high-risk individuals and intervene, they are the ones who are going to have fewer events. And per participant, per individual, you save the most money as well, and you give them the most gain. On the other side of the argument, we know that for any condition just about, the medium-risk people, who are by far the most in number, are the same people who have the most events overall. So their risk per person is maybe low, but as a group, they have the most events. So it's always difficult to argue where you draw the line between which patients you want to treat, or indeed which patients you want to screen for a disease. So those are just kind of general arguments to keep in mind before we look specifically at cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So cardiovascular disease, many of the risk factors are very well known to you and to everybody, certainly even in the general population. And there's many studies you could quote, such as the Framingham Heart Study, but for the purposes of this, and I think this is one you cover elsewhere in your in your talk, uh, sorry, in, in this session, um, the inter-heart study is as good as anywhere to start. So what they did was they studied risk factors in, an, uh, in a, in a cross-sectional study, um, and what they came up with was the top 10. And again, these will be very well known, smoking, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, diabetes, diet, poor physical exercise, alcohol excess, obesity, and then psychosocial aspects. And these, these factors together in the inter-heart study explain 90% of the attributable risk for cardiovascular disease. And this study was worldwide. This is not limited to Britain or America or anything like that. This is a worldwide study, so it represents pretty much all uh, ethnic groups across the world. Very important. And what it tells us is that really you don't need to know a huge amount to be able to predict somebody's risk. And even to take it further, if we do look specifically at Britain, then in the red I've shown you the British Regional Heart Study, that's BRHS. And what they show is that you only need three of the factors to explain 90% of risk. Okay. So it tells us that cardiovascular disease prediction using fairly simple information from risk factors is entirely possible. Not only that, of course, and certainly in the National Health Service, this has been taken on board by the government and it's really factored in to what we call the QOF targets, Quality Outcomes Framework. So in Britain, as many of you will well know, GP surgeries get reimbursed depending on how well their patients are able to achieve certain targets. 
Now, a target in itself is quite a uh, controversial idea, but nonetheless, at the moment, surgeries get paid according to how many of the patients achieve certain targets. And we know that these risk factors that they have chosen in the QAF targets are important, just simply because of the previous slide. It already shows you which are the important targets we need to try and aim at to try and improve outcomes. So, just as examples, one, I could have taken many other examples, but this is a few of them. For example, for diabetes, we want to know how many had a, were able to achieve blood pressure below 150 over 90, and how many below 140 over 80. Why? Because we know that if we can get more patients to below those targets, they will do better. Then there's one saying how many received, achieved a, a cholesterol below 5 millimoles per liter. Now again, you know, you could draw the line anywhere, but at the moment this is what's been selected, because the more people you have below 5, the better that the group will do overall. And then percentage with HbA1c levels below 59, 64, and 75 millimoles per mole. Um, those are obviously the newer kind of type of uh, units which we use, and diabetes specialist nurses will be used to them, hopefully. Then there's separate targets, for example, for coronary heart disease. So how many patients with established coronary heart disease, whether that's a previous MI, previous stent, previous bypass surgery, whatever, how many have blood pressure below 150 over 90? Again, we know that they will do better. How many have the cholesterol below 5 millimoles per liter? How many are on certain treatments, etc.? And as I say, I could have named any number of these, but really this is getting at how do we translate the information we know about risk factors into obtaining potential benefit for patients in terms of their outcomes. So how do we actually estimate one's cardiovascular risk? So let's say we have a patient in front of us, we want to work out what is their risk of having a problem, an event, over the next 10 years. Typically we use 10 years, although there is also a move now to quote somebody's risk for the rest of their life, what's somebody's lifetime risk of having a myocardial infarction, for example. So there's any range of options available, which in itself is a bit of a weakness, because now you have to choose which one. Now the longest established and very well known is the Framingham Risk Score, but there are problems with it, okay? It tends to overestimate risk in some populations. In Britain, we know the JBS2, as it's called, the JBS2 guideline, which will soon be uh, superseded by the JBS3 guideline, so that's got an online form. SIGN in Scotland, okay, obviously we're talking here from Glasgow, and this has developed some actually quite uh, novel aspects to it. And similarly, the Q-Risk database is, is developed from huge data set from England, uh, to look at risk of myocardial infarction or stroke. And literally in the last two days, there's been a massive development in America where they've released this thing called the pooled cohort equations. And they've really come up with an even more modern risk calculator. But really, when you look through these, there's many common features with a few exceptions in a sign and the Q-Risk 2, which we will look at in a few minutes. And I should stress, these are not suitable for all patients. If you've got a patient who's already had a myocardial infarction, you don't need to do a risk score. You already know that the risk is high. If you've got patients with I look after, which have familial hypercholesterolemia, we already know that their risk is huge. This is for primary prevention patients where we're not quite sure what their risk will be. Okay. And what I've already shown you on the screen, you can see that these different risk scores look at slightly different things. So, for example, the pooled cohort equation looks at all CVD outcomes, whereas Q-Risk 2, you can look at myocardial infarction or stroke. So there's slightly different things that they're assessing over the next 10 years. So this is an example of Framingham risk score. And I should also stress there are various Framingham risk scores. There's one looking at, for example, uh, development of heart failure. But this is simply one's 10-year risk of having a heart attack. And for example, all you have to factor in is your age, gender, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, smoking status, blood pressure. And with that alone, you can get to a pretty good idea of somebody's risk over the next 10 years. So I put in some uh, hypothetical values here, 50-year-old male. Uh, total cholesterol, these units are different to what we use in the, U uh, in the UK. So 160 milligrams per deciliter, you need to divide by about 40. So that's a cholesterol of approximately 4, I'll give or take a bit. HDL cholesterol of approximately 1 millimole per liter. And you can really work out risks. If you look down, lower down, you can see that this person's overall score is 12%. So what does that tell us? His risk of having a myocardial infarction over the next 10 years is 12%. And really, it depends where you are in the world according to how you evaluate that risk. It will either be above or below the threshold that your area decides is worth treating or not. So I'm going to take you through a few 
similar examples. So, for example, this is the assign score, very relevant to Scotland. It collects very similar data if you look down the list of things and you can go to the website, assign-score.com. But really the, the important things that it factors in is, for example, the postcode, I've circled it in green, family history, which wasn't in the Framingham score, because we know that frame, uh, family history is quite an important factor. And one thing it also introduces is rheumatoid arthritis. Now that's a bit specific for our talk now, but we know that people with chronic arthritis are also at high risk of CVD. So if you factor all of that in, again, you can work out somebody's uh, risk. So what this kind of introduces is this idea that also geographical location, where you live, was also an important risk factor, which we know it is, certainly in Scotland. Uh, it's been very well shown across the different regions of Glasgow. Family history is important. Rheumatoid arthritis gets introduced as well. So we can move on to the next one. Q risk is also an important uh, calculator which gets used widely in, 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 in England. And really, it's very similar to your sign. It covers many of the same risk factors. So listed down on the left-hand side of the screen, it takes you through very similar information. There's a couple of new ones. So, for example, Q-Risk has introduced atrial fibrillation, chronic kidney disease. And chronic kidney disease is certainly a high-risk condition for cardiovascular disease. Um, also, what it includes is body mass index, if you look down to the bottom. Now, body mass index is not a particularly strong risk factor, but nonetheless, they found that if they include it in their risk score, it improves your prediction ever so slightly. And so if you factor in, again, we've used a hypothetical 50-year-old male. I've put in a whole lot of different numbers for him. I've, uh, I've given him a BMI with a, weight, a height of 180, a weight of 85 kilograms. And what this does slightly differently, it gives you a graphical representation with happy faces in yellow, and you'll see sad faces in purple. And really, that's for also patients to be able to use. If they've got the information, they can factor it in gives them a graphical representation of what it looks like to have a certain risk. Um, so, anyway, a whole range of possibilities. And what I haven't shown you is this new pooled cohorts equations, which you could look up on Google, could literally just released in the last few days. So, why do we do it? As I said to you, it's a balance between the cost of finding people and how much benefit they get from the interventions you can give them. So, what, ben what interventions do we have? Now, this is telling you things you already know. Certainly for primary prevention on the right-hand side and secondary prevention, the information is much the same, but not entirely. So secondary prevention, we mean people who've already had an event in the past. So what do we want them to do? Okay, we want them to stop smoking. That goes without saying. Weight loss sounds very interesting, sounds quite plausible, but actually the evidence for weight loss improving CVD events is really not there yet. There may well be evidence, that's, but it's incredibly hard to prove. But certainly at the moment, we don't have evidence to show us that it is worthwhile now. Diet, again, very hard to prove. There was a recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine from an Italian group in the last year which showed that a diet which was high in certain oils and nuts seemed to give benefit. But again, the evidence apart from that is very slender. Salt reduction sounds very good and certainly governments wish us to take less salt. We know that salt reduction gives you lower blood pressure. And therefore, by extension, we assume it's, it's beneficial, but there's no actual trial evidence showing that a salt reduction gives you lower events. Um, albeit, it may well be true, but it hasn't been proven yet. Alcohol as well. We're advised to take this alcohol, but again, there's no proof in a trial form that it's either beneficial or harmful to take a different amount of alcohol. Medication, certainly there's huge evidence for what works and doesn't work. Aspirin, we know, certainly works for secondary prevention. Primary prevention, you start to weigh up this benefit-risk problem because if you give people aspirin, they bleed more. There's more serious bleeds. And so in primary prevention, aspirin at the moment is not really recommended. Statin therapy, certainly very well established, and ACE inhibitors, if you give it to the right patients, you will certainly reduce their risk. So moving on, we've talked about specifically predicting cardiovascular event risk in the general population. Now, what about diabetes? Because we meant to talk about both conditions. And what we see here is that very few areas actually predict risk specifically in patients with cardiovascular, uh, with diabetes. So certainly in a sign and in framing them and these other things, you can tick the box for diabetes, yes or no, but you don't actually give much specific information about diabetes itself to help you refine the risk. But there is one example. The UKPDS is one of a few others. Um, where you can actually get a slightly more specific prediction for a patient with diabetes. But I would just stress that at the moment we don't really use it. And, and one important thing that is missing from these kind of risk calculators for people with diabetes, to look at risk of MI, etc., 
is, for example, very th the thing that we measure all the time, urine albumin. People with microalbumin urea uh, actually do quite badly. They have a very high risk of heart cardiovascular disease, and that's still something that needs to be factored into any kind of guideline in the future, any kind of risk score in the future for mm -hmm. diabetes. Okay, we haven't really talked about diabetes yet. So we know that there's certain areas in the world where diabetes prevalence is very high. We know the Middle East very high. People, places in the Western world, the US, the UK, where obesity is rising, we know that rates of diabetes is already rocketing. Okay, so that's really stating the obvious. And I won't dwell on this because we're not really here to talk about the various different problems you can run into with diabetes. But just to summarize, in red, I've already highlighted a few. So we know the risk of stroke is high. We know the risk peripheral vascular disease and coronary heart disease are all high. So we know that macrovascular disease is high. And we know microvascular disease, so I've highlighted retinopathy and nephropathy. And there's a range of other problems as well, which is why we would like to, in theory, prevent people getting diabetes, and secondary, treat people well when they have this uh, disorder. So what about predicting people getting diabetes in the first place? We've talked about predicting getting cardiovascular disease. What about predicting getting diabetes? Why do we want to do this? Well, firstly, we know that we can prevent diabetes. If we can identify people at high risk, we know we can prevent it. And secondly, if we start to test for it, we know there's a wide range of people in the community right now who have diabetes already, but whom we haven't yet detected it. So what about this? Now, there's already one interesting element to introduce because for many years we've, we've advised using glucose, either fasting glucose or oral glucose tolerance tests, which those of you who, who do them, the specialist diabetes nurses who may do some of them in practice, know that this is quite a tedious test to do. It's really a bit of a pain. HbA1c we use to monitor diabetes, but there's been arguments for decades already. Can we use HbA1c as a test to also screen for and diagnose diabetes? And in the last two years, this has really finally been adopted by major health authorities across the world. And part of the reason behind that is because the test of HbA1c, everybody used to do a slightly different thing to test for it. And so you couldn't really compare HbA1c results across the world. That has changed. And the vast majority of places measuring this, you can actually be fairly confident that one test in one part of the world is going to give a very similar result to elsewhere in the world. So the World Health, health Organizations and the American Diabetes organization, which are two of the very major players in this area, now support using HbA1c to diagnose and screen for diabetes, which has been a very important development. One of the important things is you don't have to fast for HbA1c, so it really simplifies the lives of, of many uh, clinicians and health professionals here. So let's accept that HbA1c is kind of starting to develop for a test for this. What about finding people with diabetes? There's many health, there's many scores that now exist. So QD score, the Thund risk score, the Cambridge risk score, all of these exist, but I would stress that they are used all too seldom at the moment. QD score is developed by the very same data set, the very same information that we used for Q risk 2, which I already showed you a few slides behind. And why might this be helpful? Well, because we can actually intervene and prevent diabetes in these patients. Okay. How do you prevent it? Well, Diabetes Prevention Program, published a good 10 years ago now, showed very clearly if you can get people to lose weight, you will get them to reduce the chance of getting diabetes. You can even do it with metformin, with a drug, but it's less effective um, and there are some side effects. But still, it does work. We don't, just, we don't really tend to use it for that purpose at the moment. So, very same to the Q-Risk 2. You can factor in some information uh, and what you again get is this kind of happy face, sad face graphical representation of somebody's risk of getting diabetes. And you can see the website, qdscore.org. So we will quickly mention now, uh, I shouldn't have needed much more than the next five or six minutes, what is the way that we might look for these conditions together? What we would ideally like to do is if you've got Mr. Smith sitting in front of you, you'd like to be able to look at his risk of not only cardiovascular disease, but also diabetes at the same time. Now, there's two ways you might do that. You might use one overall predictor for both conditions and we'll give that a name, metabolic syndrome, you will have heard of. Or you might have them there sitting, but if you collect the right information, you could use two separate predictors to give you the information for both. And those are the kind of predictors I've already shown you. So metabolic syndrome is quite a controversial thing. And why do we want to know this? Well, we already know there's a strong link between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. This is one of many studies you might look at. And in the middle, you can tell, that in the little red dotted line, you can see that the people with diabetes uh, are much higher risk of getting cardiovascular disease already 
As it turns out, they're also at high risk of cancer death and also non-cancer death. In fact, they're at high risk of everything. So again, more reason that we want to find people with diabetes, treat them early, and we can prevent them getting further disease. Kind of an obvious point to perhaps make is that the earlier people get diabetes, the more life years they will lose in the future, the more problems they will run into unless we treat them well. So this is from the very same group, the Emerging Risk Factor Collaboration. And what you can see is that if a person develops diabetes at 40, at the moment, and for this study, they would on average lose six years of life. Now you might think, oh, it's all down to cardiovascular disease. Well, it's not. A lot of it, highlighted in black, is due to cardiovascular events, but you'll see there's other things. There's cancer, there's non-cancer related illness, and all of these result in one losing up to six years of life as one gets older, as you might imagine, if you develop diabetes at the age of 80, there's not really enough time left to lose a substantial amount of your life. But still, even then, you will lose a certain proportion. And then as the diagnosis gets later, you, you lose out on less and less and less of life. But again, it shows you the strong connection between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But it also shows you that it's not only about cardiovascular disease in people with diabetes. So what about this concept of metabolic syndrome? Now, Many people, I should stress around the world, think it's a good idea to highlight metabolic syndrome in a patient. And it's really developed from this, idea, this recognition that people at high risk of heart disease often have some features which coexist. And there's five features in metabolic syndrome which they put uh, importance on. So one is dysglycemia, abnormal glucose, adiposity or obesity, whether it's by BMI or waste, high blood pressure, low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides. So these five things have been grouped together to make this syndrome. So if you have three out of five of these which are abnormal, we say that you have metabolic syndrome. And the big debate has been, is it actually worthwhile to say yes or no somebody has metabolic syndrome? Now, I personally sit very much strongly in the camp that says, no, this, this actual syndrome doesn't help us at all. It doesn't give us any additional information above and beyond what we get from the, knowing these items alone. But nonetheless, people thought this might be a good idea. If we have somebody with metabolic syndrome, we know that at high risk of diabetes and CBD, so we can treat them. That's been the thinking behind it. I'm going to give you a quick slide just to show you why I don't think it's particularly useful. So this is the theory. We can find these five factors and we can say, yes, if you've got enough, three out of five, we know you're at high risk of type 2, two diabetes and for CBD. But the problem is, in reality, they don't really give us the same information for each condition. The reality is it looks like this. Glucose, Measures of adiposity and triglycerides are firmly in the camp of diabetes. They are very strong risk factors for diabetes. They give us a tiny bit of information about risk of cardiovascular disease, but very little. And you'll recognize that when we looked at the risk scores, Q-risk, Assign, Framingham, almost none of them use these three factors, glucose, adipose, adiposity, and, and triglyceride levels, to predict CVD. Only one of them used BMI, but the rest of them exclude these completely. Then we have hypertension or blood pressure and low HDL. And you'll note that when you looked at the CBD risk scores, all of those included these two factors. So what I'm trying to tell you is that these five factors might coexist, but they give us different information on type 2 diabetes and CBD risk. And that's really the take-home point. And that is why metabolic syndrome performs very poorly overall. And by that, I mean if you compare metabolic syndrome to, for example, the assigned score to predict cardiovascular risk, metabolic syndrome loses hands down. If you use it to predict cardiovascular risk compared to Framingham or anything else, it loses badly. So that's why we don't really tend to use it. It predicts diabetes not badly, but again, if you compare it to QD score for predicting diabetes, metabolic syndrome does not perform well enough to be adopted. And there's many reasons for that. And I've already said to you some of these. I've listed to you blood pressure, HDL cholesterol, uh, more strongly associated with cardiovascular disease, the other three with diabetes. So the end result is it tends out to be not very useful. So we don't tend to use it. Why? Truth is you can get as much information just from knowing somebody's blood pressure as you will get from metabolic syndrome overall. So I've got a graphical representation of why it really doesn't work. I've got two patients listed here, Mr. A and Mr. B. And really what I show you is, yes, you do have all these criteria. The five criteria which make up metabolic syndrome are listed in there. But overall, if you know that, you're still missing the most important risk factors. You don't have the LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. You don't have whether they smoke or not. You don't have how old they are, etc. And those are the things you really need to predict somebody's cardiovascular risk properly. And so you'll see that even though Mr. A meets five out of five of the metabolic syndrome criteria, 
the man who is at very high risk and the one that you want to be treating for cardiovascular risk. So really that's my take on, cardiovascular, on metabolic syndrome and really why, why it might be a research tool to some extent, but for prediction of diabetes and CBD really doesn't really work. Now I'm only going to take an instant here just to show you. So what I would suggest that you, and that everybody in the future does, is that you can predict both CBD and diabetes at, as the patient sits in front of you, but even and you can collect all the information you need with a couple of very simple blood tests and with some very simple information. But what my argument, and certainly that of my colleagues, is that you use this information to still use two separate scores to predict CBD and diabetes separately. And this little paper actually showed that what you can also start doing is using HbA1c. You can do that very effectively because now you don't need the patient to fast. You can do lipids without needing to fast, really. You can do HbA1c without needing to fast. You can predict both conditions separately. So now I'm really getting towards the end. I was going to give you one kind of slight snippet, which doesn't challenge anything I've told you, but just to show you that diabetes and cardiovascular disease go together, but sometimes they give you slightly contrary information when you treat them. So what our group and others have now shown is that out of interest, we know that there's no question if you give the appropriate patient a statin or if you control their blood pressure with a thiazide or a beta blocker, you will reduce their risk. Interestingly, this is at one cost. People who don't have diabetes who take these drugs turn out to be at high risk of getting diabetes. So just to make the general point that all therapies have a risk and a benefit connected to them without question. What comes down to your role is weighing up the risk and the benefit in each patient and deciding that it's worth it. So this is some information from statins, which showed exactly what I've told you. They reduce CBD. We know that very well. They also, reduce, they also increase the risk of getting diabetes. But overall, if you look at it, it's quite clear that the benefit outweighs the risk. It's just a matter of communing to your, communicating to your patient that there is risk and benefit. But in your individual case, for example, that the risk is hugely outweighed by the benefit. So really, I think I will wrap up there. I'll look at the questions, which I've already got some of them printed out here. I know that we were struggling to hear my colleague Liz. So Kenji, unless there's a, another reason, I could start to read through these questions and address some of them. Is that okay? Can I do that? Uh, yeah, yeah. That that would be fine. Yeah, that that'd be great. Okay, so I've got some and, questions and Judith, printed out from Judith people who want to ask some questions too. Um, she can just okay. type into the chat if you like, Judith. Okay, well, if you've got anything, Judith, to to type down, please feel free. In the meantime, I'll read through some of the questions we have here. So. One is about the assigned score. The question is, how does the scoring of a sign account for those with additional unfavorable measurements of BMI, waist circumference, for example, LDL, cholesterol, triglycerides? So the answer really is that these scores have been developed. They've considered all these when they were developing the score. And the fact is that they just weren't good enough. They didn't give you enough additional information to identify high risk, medium risk, and low risk patients. So it's simply on each score, they've developed it and they found that they didn't give enough information. One important thing, triglycerides I've mentioned with BMI and waste, they really are diabetes risk factors, not CBD risk factors. So they are in a different category. LDL cholesterol is mentioned in the question, do we need to consider LDL cholesterol? But the point is that if you go back to these risk scores, so I might actually go back to one of them just quickly to show you if that's okay. Um, what you will see is that, for example, in the Framingham risk score, you are asking for total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol. And really, it's the difference between HDL and total cholesterol gives you what we call your non-HDL cholesterol, or the bad stuff, if you like. And really, LDL cholesterol, whether you use LDL cholesterol, whether you use non-HDL cholesterol, which is the difference between total and HDL cholesterol, doesn't really matter. It gives you very much the same information. So what I'm saying is that effectively LDL cholesterol is already captured in these risk scores, just we call it something slightly different. We call it non-HDL cholesterol, which gives you very similar information. The next question was about ethnicity. Should we be adding ethnicity to these kind of scores to predict risk? Now that's a very good point, because certainly we know that, for example, South Asian population is studied very heavily in Glasgow, and we know that the risk of getting both diabetes and CBD is high. So I think you make a very good point. Typically, these scores don't ask for this information. The assigned score, to some extent, asks for it by asking for postcode because we know the demographics of each population area. We know how many patients that are either white European or South Asian live there. So we factor it into an extent. But I would say that the new score, this pooled risk score that I mentioned in America, now does specifically ask for ethnicity. 
So I fully agree that is an important point which up to now we haven't really fully captured, but that is now starting to come through. The next question was about statistics of CBD risk scoring. It says, is there a mandatory requirement to carry out risk scoring for those at the high risk, e.g. diabetes? Now, certainly in the, assign, uh, sorry, in the COF targets now, it's important at least that you, you have to defend as a general practitioner that you've measured all the important risk factors. Um, so yes, to some extent there is, and you, the surgeries get paid. So if they get more patients with diabetes below certain categories, so if they get cholesterols below X and blood pressures below X, the surgery is remunerated. So actually there's a whole business case for why these surgeries these days are checking these risk factors and controlling them. Um, so yes, in essence. The next question was from somebody specifically says, I'm a diabetic specialist nurse and I wondered what is my role, if any, in CBD risk and prevention with type 2 diabetes patients. Now, in my perspective, you will know yourself, some of the GP partners will have a diabetes clinic once a week or whatever and see patients. But your role is probably the most important in preventing CBD risk. Patients with diabetes, certainly over the age of 40, we know are at pretty high risk of getting diabetes, especially if they've had the condition for a long time. And really, the most important thing, apart from controlling blood glucose, which we'll talk about with the next question coming next, we know that is important to an extent. But the most important things that can be done to reduce risk of diabetes is to make sure blood pressure is controlled and to make sure that the patient is on a statin. If those two things are done, you have done a huge amount to make sure that your patient's risk is as low as it should be. So my simple message is that checking blood pressure might seem pretty mundane at times. Checking the odd blood test for cholesterol as you do on an annual basis, for example, but really following up those results, and if they're not adequately controlled, making sure that you bring it to the attention of the relevant doctor or take appropriate action yourself, those are the hugely important things to reduce risk in a particular patient overall and, and in overall population. If you can do that for an individual patient, uh, basis for each patient you see, you'll be able to bring down the overall risk in your population very well. Now, hopefully one day we'll reach the stage where everybody that should be is on a statin and everybody's got very well controlled blood pressure. And at that point, you can retire. But until that point, you do have a huge amount to, 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 to give us in, in primary care as a diabetes specialist nurse. The next question really overlapped with that. It said, if you could choose, really, would you start treating blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes all at once in a patient? Or how would you prioritize between them? Now, I'll probably answer this in a slightly different way. If you were to choose one, if you were to take a patient with diabetes, which was pretty controlled, who had bad blood pressure and high cholesterol, which one would you choose to treat first? And actually, we've looked at this. The, the thing that you can control that gives you the most benefit would be blood pressure. In a patient with diabetes, blood pressure is a very important risk factor. It's not that easy to treat because sometimes patients respond differently to therapy, but for controlling blood pressure, you get the most bang for your buck, if you like followed by cholesterol. And very important, it's very easy to put people on statins these days and they cost very little. So that's the, the easiest one to do is to put somebody on a statin and you get not quite as much benefit as you do for controlling blood pressure, but not far away from it. Those two quite clearly are the most important risk factors. Blood glucose is important to an extent, but we, we, controlling blood glucose for cardiovascular disease doesn't give you that a huge amount of benefit, it gives you a bit. So really, it's third in the, in, the, in, the, in the list of the three. But of course, if you've got a patient with very poorly controlled blood glucose, they may well have other symptoms which makes it important to control. And of course, we're not even talking here about microvascular risk, retinopathy, nephropathy. So blood glucose is important a little bit for CVD, but more so for microvascular risks. But for reducing CVD, I would say start with blood pressure and cholesterol because they're easy to do and they give you the most value. Next question was about blood pressure. Would you initiate antihypertensive therapy after just one or two readings with the patients in front of you, or would you follow the recommendations? Um, generally, my view would be the recommendations are fine. Often you will measure blood pressure at a single sitting, and it will be higher because the patient is nervous or they've just run in the door. And quite typically, we don't really take blood pressure very well. We don't let the patient sit for long enough because you don't have time. Or we don't repeat it to see that's a trend of high blood pressure. So myself, I would tend to follow the hypertension guidelines, try and get a repeat value, and if it's elevated, you can treat the patient. Um, 
There were so many questions about ethnicity and race circumference. I think we kind of addressed those, but absolutely true that ethnicity is an important factor. So South Asians, for example, we know that they get diabetes, their risk for diabetes goes up at a much lower waist circumference than for white Europeans. So yes, you do actually need to factor that information in, and the risk scores don't particularly do it well enough at the moment, but if you have that information, you will know that, for example, groups that are South Asian, as an example for Glasgow, because it's relevant, these individuals who come forward, you need to think along different lines to white Europeans because they do get diabetes at far lower waist circumferences. Um, question is, some healthcare professionals use a diabetes risk assessment tool. Is there any scope to have a combined CBD diabetes risk assessment tool? Really, at the moment, as we've discussed with metabolic syndrome, it doesn't work. A single tool to assess both with the same kind of measurement doesn't really work. But you can still do it at the same time. If you've got the important information, if you've got cholesterol, blood pressure, age, smoking status, family history, and, and whatever you need, you can predict CBD risk. If you can measure HbA1c, measure the patient's BMI, no family history of diabetes, you can work out their diabetes risk. And you can do that all at the same time. All I'm saying is I would use different calculators or different risk groups for each condition. So if that makes sense. Next question was, can you explain why waist circumference, triglycerides, and glucose are uh, considered to be three f factors for CVD, but they're really strongly uh, connected to type 2 diabetes? So that's really the diabetes, the metabolic syndrome argument. Um, the question is quite difficult to answer because it says, can you explain why these factors are connected with one disease strongly and not with another? Really, that just comes down to the types of studies that have shown this. So these have been huge epidemiology studies with millions of patients, which quite clearly show that those three factors are associated with both conditions, but they're far more strongly linked to diabetes than CBD. So I can't really give you a better answer than to say that that's what the data have shown us. Um, I'm afraid that's just, you know, a fact. It doesn't mean that they're not important measuring them. It just means that when you measure them, you must think along the lines of their diabetes risk, because they don't really give you much information about CBD risk. Next question was about QRISC2 and atrial fibrillation. It says, QRISC2 asks about atrial fibrillation. Including it gives a much higher score. But if you use this risk calculator, would you only tick atrial fibrillation if the patient had atrial fibrillation the whole time? Or would you tick it if the, you know, would you tick it if the patient had atrial fibrillation some of the time and not others? Um, or if it had been present in the past but was no longer a problem? Now that's, a, again, a tricky question to answer because, but I see your point. You do get some patients who have intermittent atrial fibrillation. Um, you get some people who have consistent atrial fibrillation. You get some people, people who used to have atrial fibrillation but who've had a treatment or they've had cardioversion, whether by drug or in hospital, whatever, and now they no longer have atrial fibrillation. My advice would be to only tick the box if it's a patient with no atrial fibrillation who's sitting in front of you with atrial fibrillation. Really, that's how they've done the, the risk scoring. They haven't factored in people who used to have it and no longer have it. They haven't factored in people who have it maybe a certain proportion of the time. So I would say if the patient's got it in front of you and they're known to have it and they're on the treatment for it, that's when you should be ticking that box. Um, final question that says, I'm an international student in Glasgow studying healthcare. I want to ask you, if the diabetic patient's blood glucose are controlled, how, how much lower can you get the cardiovascular risk? So, kind of, we, we've covered this to a large extent already. If you've got a patient with diabetes and you want to control their cardiovascular risk, I would say the best and the first place to start, make sure their blood pressure gets controlled, make sure their cholesterol is controlled by statin. Those are the two most important things you can do. Blood glucose is important for other reasons, but it doesn't particularly change one's cardiovascular risk very much. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying it's important for other reasons in diabetes. So if you've already got the patient's blood glucose controlled, like you say, how much, you know, does that add very much to CBD risk? No, not particularly. Start with the blood pressure and the cholesterol, then worry about the blood glucose. And that's really a long-term game because you want to reduce the patient's risk of getting retinopathy, nephropathy, and other problems. It's not unimportant. It's just important for other reasons than CVD. So that was the questions I had. If there's anything else for anybody listening that wants to fire across, then, then please go for it. So Kenji's put up one. It says, someone had asked in the course about the length of time spent in a postcode, which isn't captured by the assessment tool. Is this a significant factor? Should there be a minimum time spent in a postcode? Now, that is an impossible question to answer. The way that they, you really have to think along the lines of how these scores have been developed. 
And all they've been able to do is look at patients who were living at the postcode at the time that they did their analysis. So that factors in the fact or the factors in already that patients had been living at a postcode for a different a variable point of time. From the point of view of a specialist nurse, I can appreciate you might see a patient who comes to you who's lived in, let's say, a very deprived area for their entire life and they've just moved to a new area. Then I can imagine that you may well want to use the previous postcode. But overall, by and large, that's you know a weakness of any single uh, kind of risk calculator. But it shouldn't have a huge impact on the performance of the risk scores overall because by and large the patients that you see are going to have lived in your area for a reasonable amount of time. So it's an important kind of point where I can see on a day-to-day -day basis it's a bit tricky to deal with but uh, overall the impact of it should be pretty low and if somebody's just moved to an area then I could see that there's a good reason to use their previous postcode at least for a period of time. So but how much does HbA1c contribute to the risk assessment of CVD? Well, at the moment, um, none of the risk scores, as you will have seen, put much emphasis on it. They do, however, ask, does the patient have diabetes, yes or no? And I think if we go to one tool here, this is the UK PDS tool. If you use this for CVD prediction, you'll see that it does include HbA1c. You'll see I've put in a patient with 9% CVD risk score. Um, so it's, it's important to an extent, my own advice would be it's not a particularly strong cardiovascular risk factor, it's fairly modest and I think there's been many large trials recently which have shown us that we shouldn't get too bothered about HbA1c. If it's reasonably well controlled, if it's 7 or 8%, then for cardiovascular disease you probably can't get it much better apart from controlling blood pressure and cholesterol as I've already said, but where it is important is for microvascular risk over the long term. So it's not a particularly strong cardiovascular risk factor. It helps to a certain extent, but not very much. Um, so a few more things have been added. Interheart studies show that several identified conditions accounted for 90% of the risk. But this one, but the British score only accounted for 90%. How do these compare? Well, that's kind of, did the interhearts show that others only accounted for a very small proportion of the 90%? Yes, effectively, that's the answer. Now, if you do these kind of studies in different areas, you get slightly different answers. The inter-heart study, all, all studies have weaknesses, which, if you're an academic like me, you might focus on. But for you in the field, treating patients, you, we, we don't want you to get particularly hung up on the weaknesses of different studies. But, for example, inter-heart was what we call a cross-sectional study. They didn't follow these people up. They simply got them in, and they measured risk factors as they sat there. But what you really want to do in a high quality study is you want to follow up patients for over a period of time. You need to factor that in. But the strength that InterHeart does, had was that they did it in hundreds of thousands of people. So you're always weighing up in your study what's feasible. How, can you follow people up over time? And if so, how few patients, you know, how many fewer patients does that mean you can study? So InterHeart was good from the perspective that it had lots of people. The British Regional Heart Study was good from the perspective that it followed up people for a long time. So they give you slightly different information, but I think really what they tell us is that you get pretty much the same risk factors. If, if that study, the British study, added on those other risk factors, instead of explaining 90% of the risk, they probably would have been able to explain 95% of the risk. So I don't want you to think of these studies as showing you very different information. I want you to focus on the fact that they give you pretty much the same information, just to a very slightly different extent. And also the Interheart, of course, studied the whole world, really, whereas our British study only focused on an area of Britain. So largely they give you pretty much the same information, um, albeit with slightly different values. So I can see from Kenji's message questions that have been sent in that is pretty much the end of it. So unless, unless uh, Judith wants to throw in a last question, she may well have done so in the questions I had already. I think she's typing us a message, so I'll wait for that one to appear and when we've addressed with Judith any questions she might come up with then we will close after that. So I'll just give her a second, because a uh, computer at least is taking it. She's typing us a message. Sorry, David, um, just as uh, Judith is typing, so wouldn't it be better if someone created um, an online assessment risk test that captured all of the elements for both mm -hmm. areas, CVD and diabetes, but then reported them using two scores? Absolutely, that's a very reasonable suggestion. I mean, I think the Q-risk people would argue that 
you know, all you have to do is click on two different websites. So effectively, you know, yes, in essence, what would be nice and neat, I fully agree with you, if they could have just put the list of everything in, in, on one web page and it gave you two different scores for diabetes and uh, CBD, that would be a much simpler solution for people. Um, but anyway, they haven't chosen to do that. I think their worry is probably that if they put a list of criteria and all of a sudden you need to enter more information, that people might not be inclined to use a risk score. The risk scores are good because they're simple. And they probably think that if they put more criteria down, that it may just look too complicated and people won't use it. But as a general point, I would fully agree. That would be my solution. I would rather put everything on one web page and then some of the risk factors get used for diabetes, some get used for CVD, and that's the simplest solution. So in principle, I do agree with you. Yeah, I do agree with you completely. Okay, I should discuss with some of the other techs at, at the university, and, and we should present an interface for you to <laughs> assess and uh, try and come up with something <laughs> like that. So Judith just wanted to say, no, my question was the one about diabetic cholesterol. Um, well, yes, I don't want to, yeah, the HbA1c really has been flagged up as a very controversial area in recent times. So. There's been the trials which you would have come across, hopefully, called ACCORD, and that is one study mainly conducted in America and in Canada. And then you've got kind of from the major Australian study, ADVANCE, and the fact that they gave very different results, although they were trying to do the same thing, which was control HbA1c tightly, is kind of caught everybody by surprise. But I think one thing to first keep in mind with is that they were talking about taking people who were reasonably controlled. They weren't terribly controlled. They were reasonable and trying to get them very tightly controlled. They weren't talking about the old days of the UK PDS study where you took people who had terrible control and you were just trying to get them reasonable. That seemed to give a lot of benefit. What we're talking about now is how much do you get for your heart if you go from reasonable control to very good control. And there is still a big debate there. If I was to summarize what the studies have shown us, what I would say is, if you've got a newly diagnosed patient who does not have a history of CVD, then you probably give them benefit, not in, only microvascular, but also for their heart, if you can control them pretty well. But the evidence seems to suggest that if you've got a patient who's had diabetes for a long time, 10 years or more, or if they've got a history of established CVD, they've already had a myocardial infarction, or they've already had a stent or a bypass, or whatever, those patients are a bit fragile, they're a bit brittle, and you need to take a more cautious approach. So you shouldn't, in those patients, be trying for heroic reductions in HbA1c because it doesn't seem to give you any benefit and it may, in fact, introduce harm. But that doesn't bring into the argument the question of uh, microvascular disease. And so of, of, overall, we do want lower blood sugar by, by and large is better, but I would just say that in patients with established CVD or with long-standing diabetes, you shouldn't be trying for major reductions. You should probably be trying for somewhere between 7 to 8 percent HbA1c, and that's pretty much good enough, I would say. At least that's what the evidence we have at the moment would show us. Okay, I, I think that's probably, um, <laughs> I was going to say all we have time for, but we've clearly gone over that. <laughs> Mark. Yeah, no, we have no <laughs> But I, I really appreciate you taking the time to deliver the presentation, and as somebody who doesn't have much medical knowledge, I found it fascinating. I have to say. Good. Well, I, I hope people managed to catch up, and I'm sorry we had a bit of a mix-up for the uh, date we had arranged. That was just, I think, an oh, error on both our parts, but that's, but that's okay. We can sort that out in the future. Yeah. I, I think it was an excellent presentation, and I think the people watching it later on will be um, extremely impressed. I mean, it's it, it was great. Okay. Okay, well, thanks for your time, and uh, hopefully the system has picked us up, and um, Judith, thank you for joining us, and again, I'm sorry for a uh, bit of an area yesterday, but um, you know, if Liz picks up any further questions from you or your colleagues by email or whatever, I'll be happy to try and address them as far as I can. But as you can see, there's still a lot of unknowns out there. You know, nobody has all the answers yet. There's still huge questions, even though this this field is one of the best studied in the world. Okay, brilliant. I'll close the session now, and uh, thanks again for everyone.